let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome back to ECS 2210. Last week, we started uh, introducing bipolar junction transistors, and we discussed how the transistor is actually made and basically why how it works and why it has certain current voltage characteristics uh, this week we are going to continue our discussions on uh, bipolar transistors and uh, talk about a very important topic or like two important topics of large signal and small signal models of a bipolar transistor understanding these models and understanding the where they come from and how to use them is very critical in analyzing any kind of a transistor-based circuits that uses bipolar transistors. Okay, so as a recap, this is the kind of a transistor that we introduced and discussed about it. We said that it's made of three doped regions forming a sandwich. There's an n-type material, we call it the emitter. There's a p-type material in the middle, we call it base. And then another n-type material that we call it collector. We said that if you want to be more accurate, because emitter is much more heavily doped than the base and collector, we call this N type material, an N plus type material, to show that it has higher level of doping. Uh, later, we discussed the flow of charge carriers and this kind of like basically we saw that the, this this NPN kind of a structure uh, is made of two different PN junctions one between the base and emitter and one between base and collector and we saw the movement of charge carriers throughout this uh, through this uh, npn structure and how uh, basically what kind of a current do we have and how this current is actually uh, controlled by the voltage across different terminals okay we saw that the emitter emits and collector collects the charge carriers and the base is really there to control the flow uh, then we, we introduced the symbol that we use for transistors. We said that, well, we are going to show this uh, symbol in a way that it, uh, it kind of implies that we have a current flowing from, because of this, this arrowhead, we have a current flowing from this, uh, from collector to emitter. And when we were discussing that, uh, when we were discussing the movement of charges, we saw that the electrons are actually moving from the emitter all the way to collector. So it makes sense that the actual current, which is uh, flowing in the opposite direction of the uh, electron movement, um, it, it will be from collector to emitter. And uh, we saw that how base is going to, I'm going, I'm going to show you the equations in the next slide, but we saw that how base is actually controlling this flow of the current. We also said that uh, because we have three different junctions or three different terminals, this is different. This is new for us because all the other uh, elements that we have seen before, they all all of them had two terminals, either in the ECS2200 or in ECS2210. They all had two terminals, so the current and voltage had a one-to-one -one kind of a relationship. Here we said that uh, we have a three-terminal device, therefore the current of each flowing between different terminals um, is going to have basically it could be dependent on the voltage across different terminals and since we have three different uh, terminals i'm going to have vbe i'm going to have vbc and vce and each of them could assume positive and negative values that means that i could have two to the power of three different possibilities but fortunately only one of these combinations or one of these possibilities is the one that has a practical value for us. And that is basically when the VBE or the base emitter junction is in forward bias, meaning that the VBE is greater than zero or VB is greater than VE, right? So there's a diode, if I just wanna put the symbol here, there's a diode between this PN, uh, across this PN junction, and there's another diode here, right? So we have two diodes here, and we said that the only case, only combination of all these eight different combinations that we care about is when this diode is forward biased and that diode is reversed bias. And when we were actually talking about charge carrier movements, we saw why this forward bias and that reverse bias are actually useful for us and how they actually work so that my transistor has a current flowing from emitter to collector that is controlled by the voltage at the base. Okay, 
So we want VP to be greater than VE, and at the same time, I want VP to be smaller than VC, right? V base smaller than V collector. We call this transistor's uh, situation uh, or this transistor mode and the active mode of operation. So when we say that the transistor is operating in the active mode, it means that, so let me actually write that here. So active mode simply means that V base emitter is greater than zero and V base collector is smaller than zero. Okay, so this way we say that our transistor is on and it's in the active mode. And then we try to find out what is the uh, expression for the collector current, for the emitter current, and the base current. Uh, to find these expressions, we did uh, analysis of the charge carrier movements in the transistor. So let's say that this is my NPN sandwich. We said that to make sure that this happens, the base has to be very thin. The emitter has to be uh, highly doped. So let's call that N plus. And the base is P and the collector is N, right? And we saw that we have a huge flow of electrons once we make sure that the base emitter diode, so this is collector. So once we make sure that the base emitter diode is forward biased, we know that the depletion region across this junction of the PN junction between base and emitter uh, is gonna be thinner and thinner as we increase the base emitter voltage. And after a certain voltage, the, the barrier is completely removed. So I have a lot of charges moving from emitter to the base. And because the base is thin, uh, very little of them is going to recombine with the holes in the p-type material of the base. And because base is p-type material, it doesn't have a lot of electrons in it to begin with. So when the electrons are actually coming into the base uh, on the on the bottom side, at, the, at this edge, we have a lot of electrons. And at the top side, at this edge, we have very little electrons. So because of this distribution difference, uh, we are going to have diffusion of electrons across the base going from the bottom to top. And then uh, because of the thinness of the base, these electrons reach the collector base uh, junction very quickly. And at the, once they get there, because the base collector junction is reversed by us, they experience a really strong uh, electric field that shoots them into the collector region. So very small number of them get uh, recombine in the base region and the majority of them get to the collector region. So that's pretty much the summary of all we discussed related to the charge carrier movement. And because of that, the current that reaches the collector region is really the current that is made by the base emitter diode, by the forward, by a forward uh, bias of the base emitter diode. So it's not a surprise to see that uh, the current of the collector has an expression that is very similar to a diode's uh, current voltage expression, right? So we know that for a diode, we had ID is equal to IS e to the power of uh, VD over VT, right? VD being the voltage across the diode. Now I have a diode between base and emitter. So the voltage across that diode will be VBE. And the current is going to be, the current that I'm talking about uh, or I'm interested in is the current that reaches the collector, right? So that's the collector current. So I get this expression for the collector current. Later we discussed that like why the base current is gonna be um, a fraction of this collector current. Let's say that just uh, briefly mentioning the reason is that like part of this base current is uh, the, the, the holes that are actually get recombined with these flow of electrons that are going from the emitter to the base, to, to the collector, but these holes are very a very small number compared to the electrons that reach to the collector. And part of it is because, well, you have a forward bias PN junction. So uh, you have a lot of electrons going from the uh, N type side, from the emitter to the base. And well, you have some holes going from the P type side to going to the emitter, from base to the emitter. But because the emitter is much more, much heavier, uh, that is doped much heavier than, uh, than the base, uh, you can imagine that the number of electrons going from emitter to base is actually much greater than the number of uh, the holes that are traveling from the base to emitter. We said that, let's say that the doping ratio between emitter and base is 100. We call that doping ratio beta. 
So the current of the base is going to be 1 over beta or 1%, let's say, uh, of that collector current. Okay. Uh, and then since all of these are actually initiated from the emitter, we know that the emitter current is going to be the addition of collector current plus base current. Also, KCL could confirm that for us. Um, we said all of these to, and then we, at the end, we said that basically uh, when a transistor is given to, to you, uh, there are two things that should be given to you as well. One is the IS, which is the reverse uh, saturation current of the base emitter diode, which sets this parameter here. And the other one is beta, which is really telling you it could be a number between uh, 50 to 200. And it's telling you what is the ratio of doping of the emitter over the base. OK, but the more important observation that we can have from these expression or expressions was the fact that the collector current. So let me actually erase these arrowheads. So if I look at this expression, is the most important one, I can appreciate that the collector current is actually a function of the base emitter voltage and nothing else, right? So the IS is a constant, VT is a thermal voltage, it's also constant, it's a 26 millivolts, if you don't remember, at room temperature. So the collector current is actually a function of the, uh, basically the voltage between base and emitter. So I can actually say that, I can, I can claim that my transistor is really a voltage controlled current source, meaning that uh, the current that is the, the current at the collector is really dependent on the voltage at the base emitter. And this dependence is actually exponential. So this is what I've shown here. So if I have if I connect my base to a variable voltage source and keep the collector's voltage at a constant value, then if I start changing the VBE, the base voltage, because well all I need to do is to change VB because VE, which is the emitter's voltage, is actually zero, right? So as I change the base voltage, which will change the base emitter voltage, I'll see that the collector current is, um, as I increase the base voltage, the collector current increases exponentially, right? But a more interesting plot, a more interesting plot would be this one, where I keep the base emitter voltage constant, and I start to change the voltage at the collector, right? Now that I see that for different or for the fixed base emitter voltage, like for example, if VBE is VB1, let's say it's like, I don't know, 0.5 volts, the current that I have at the collector, my IC is a constant value, no matter what is the VCE. So I'm changing the X axis is the VCE. I'm changing the collector voltage and I see that there's no change in the current of the collector, right? That's that's very interesting for us. And then I see that the only way that I can actually change the collector current and get a, let's say, higher current is to actually increase the VBE, the base voltage, right? And because of that, I said that, so as long as I have this transistor and somehow I fix this base voltage, let's say emitter is ground, and I fix the base voltage, let's say, to 0 0.7, Right? I can literally connect anything to this collector side, and I know that whatever I connect here might change the voltage of the collector, right? Depending on what do I have here. If I have a resistor going to some, I don't know, 5 volt voltage source, or if I have a current source here, or if I have anything here, there is going to be different voltages at this at this node, which is the collector of my transistor, right? But I can see from this plot here that the voltage at the collector is not really setting the current of the collector, which is this guy, right? So the IC, let's call it. So, or let's actually use the same notation, so capital IC. So what does that tell me? That tells me that whatever I have inside this orange box, which is my transistor plus a, a voltage source that sets the base voltage, is can be called a current source. Right? Because what I know uh, uh, from the definition of a current source is that the current source is a component that if I connect it to a, to a node in my circuit, it doesn't matter what is the voltage of the node or what do I connect to that node. And I'm talking about this node here, right? Uh, 
it, it is going to give me the same current no matter what is connected to that node, right? And that is what this transistor is doing for me, right? Now, if I draw my box in a different way, let's say I draw my box in this way, right? Or, well, to be more precise, just draw the box across the transistor. Then what I see here is that I have a voltage source, a battery, connected to some box that is on one end is connected to ground, and on the other end could be connected to, well, something arbitrary, right? And I can be sure that the current here, this current I, is a function of, let's call this Vx, right? That's the voltage of my base. It's a function of Vx. So what do I, what can I say about this box? I can say that this is a voltage controlled current source. What voltage is controlling it? Vx or base voltage. What current I'm referring to? The current of the collector I see, right? So that is why I can actually say a transistor, uh, at least when we are talking about its DC operation, and when we are not really talking about very small changes in the signals or very small changes, perturbations in the voltages and current, in the very basic form of it, a transistor is a voltage controlled current source. I hope this was clear.